This is Dr. R. Winston Mazakis. I welcome you to our page on youtube.com and I am happy that you're listening to one of our Bible studies. In this message, I will discuss Daniel chapter 2 part 1 that discusses the Babylonian Empire in prophecy. Chapter 2 of Daniel discusses the main empires and governments that have ruled the world and will rule until the second advent of Christ fascinating Bible studies. I hope and pray that they will be a blessing to your life. And if you find a blessing in listening to this subject, please tell others so they might listen also. And if you would like to hear more in-depth Bible studies, please go to youtube.com. Put my name, Winston Mazakis, on the search line and click enter. Once you are on our pages, you can choose the subject you would like to listen to in English, French, or Arabic. If you would like to earn a theology degree, graduate of theology or doctor of theology, please go to our website www.memjohn.com to visit the page that gives you all the information you need to know about our institute and the page that describes the courses. Thank you for your time and God bless you richly. This is tape 520, Introduction to the Book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 2, we read a beautiful short story. As a matter of fact, the book of Daniel is one book that has several short stories. I was surprised as I was reading the Bible, that's quite a few years ago, to see that it contained some very beautiful short stories. Even though the English and American literature proclaim that Edgar Allan Poe started what we call the short stories, I'm sure the one that made the statement probably never read the Bible because the Bible is full of beautiful short stories. However, these short stories are true short stories. This story that is the center of our attention this morning is particularly beautiful because it does not only tell us about some events that happened to certain people way in the past, but it gives us fantastically an enormous view of history as we are going to see this week. It will be impossible to cover this chapter in one meeting. And this is why it may take about six meetings to cover this chapter. This chapter is on prophecy. Beside its being a short story, it's a story plus a panoramic view of history from the point of view of prophecy. And in this chapter, it covers the span from the foundation of the Babylonian Empire until the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. I would like to draw your attention here, something about the prophet and the difference between the prophet and the historian. The historian waits and waits and waits till the event takes place, and he writes the event, sometimes accurately, sometimes not very accurately, because he misses some of the points. But the beautiful thing about the prophecy and the prophets is that when God gives a picture to the prophet to write about or event to predict, you will find out that the prophet wrote not only the history, he wrote the causes and the effects and the ramification, a beautiful whole picture of the event that no historian under any circumstances can write. That's the difference between historians and the prophet. And then when the year comes for that prophecy to be fulfilled, then it's fulfilled exactly as prophesied. The only difference is that if you study it more in detail, study that event, you would find out exactly what the Bible said the causes would be. Those were the causes, and exactly history recorded the causes, exactly as the prophet predicted them. Then you study the ramification. The ramification may, may take years after the event takes place. One historian that lived in that era may never see all the ramification that the prophet saw and God allowed him to see hundreds and hundreds of years before it happened. This is why we say years and years later, historians could look back and see and say, oh my, that's really what the Bible told us would happen. 
and now we can see it lots clearer because now we have the hindsight way back and we can see it that it was exactly as it was prophesied. Now the, this story here about Daniel, which is a beautiful story, it tells us about a king. His name was Nebuchadnezzar, a great king, had a tremendous power in his kingdom. One day he saw a dream. When he saw that dream, he was disturbed and he wanted to know the real meaning of that dream. He called his wise men for sure. These were the ones to call to tell you what was the meaning of your dream. And the wise men came running in the middle of the night to see what the great king wanted of them. And when uh, they were gathered in his audience, he said, all right, you go ahead. They looked at him again and look ahead what? Yeah, tell me what was my dream. Now, uh, oh, wait a minute, hold it. The, the head wise man said, now you're supposed to tell us the dream and we will conjure up some kind of an explanation for it. Oh, no, I don't want you to conjure anything. I want the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And in order to know that you are telling me the truth and not just conjuring some kind of explanation that just comes to your mind, you tell me the dream and when you tell me the interpretation of it, then I know for sure you are telling the truth. Now hold it, mister. You first tell us the dream. Now in order to ease it on them, he said like he said in verse 5 of chapter 2 of Daniel, he said, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. Now, this has really double meaning there. He either is telling them that he forgot the dream, which I doubt, or this is the Easterner's way of trying to tell them, I'm pretending to have forgotten it, which I believe it's the truth. So you can tell me the dream, so I can trust your interpretation to that dream. They looked at him and one of them with audacity said, well, no king in the world asked of his wise men to tell him what was his dream. You tell us a dream. And he got mad. Like they're saying, you're not just in this case. You're not a just king. And he got furious. You're telling me I'm not just. You're telling me that I am not a good king. He got so furious telling them what liars they are. They've been conjuring some kind of explanations to everything he's asking them. That was not true. He told them how fake they were. And he said, I don't have use for fakers in my palace. I've been feeding you, giving you all kind of gifts and money and positions and prestige. And what do I get from you? empty words get out of here and he ordered the palace guards to arrest them for they were living like parasites in the palace for a long period of time without use put them under arrest and ready them to be beheaded so and he said go collect the rest of the wise men that i didn't invite in the middle of the night and round them up move them in some kind of a corral and kill them all and the guards went around rounding up the wise men like rounding up some steers for the slaughter. Four men that were counted amongst the wise men to be arrested were Daniel, Shedrick, Meshach, and Abednego. The chief of police came to him and he told him that he was under arrest. That was Ariat, the chief of police. And Daniel asked him, why are we under arrest? Well, he said, because all you wise men have been living like parasites in the king's palace. Every time he wanted something, you just tell him what he wanted to hear and faking up some kind of explanations. And when he asked your head wise men to tell him what was his dream, they wouldn't even know what was his dream. See, he told him he forgot the dream. And the wise men told him, if you forgot what you forgot, how can we know what you forgot? That's impossible. Impossible. No one can do that. Well, Daniel said, wait a minute, hold it, hold it. Don't take us. Just give us a little time. We can do that. You know what Ariat thought, the chief of police? 
he thought he was just stalling for time. He was like the other unwise men. They wouldn't know anything. But he was stalling for time. Well, he said, you're not going to lose anything. Just give us a little time. I assure you, we would come up with the explanation to the king's dream and we will tell him his dream. The four young men went on their knees before God and prayed to the God of heaven. And you know what? The God of heaven, to their beautiful pleasure, revealed the dream to Daniel. And he went back to Ariok and told him to take him to Nebuchadnezzar, the great king of Babylon. And he said, I know what was the king's dream, and I will tell the king what was his dream. Can you believe someone would tell you and come to you and tell you, well, I know what you dreamt last night? That's impossible because I forgot what I dreamt last night. How would you know what I dreamt last night? That's impossible. But he said, okay, if you know the dream, I'll take you to the king. Now you make sure because once you go in, you better know what you're talking about. Otherwise he'll for sure cut your head off. He said, yes, I know. You take me there. He took him to the king and he said to the king and gave him a beautiful testimony. In chapter 2 of Daniel and verse 28, listen to his beautiful testimony. Verse 28. But there is a God in heaven who revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he who revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. He prepared the king to tell him why he even dreamed his dream. Can you imagine that? On your bed, when your head was on your pillow, you were alone in your bedroom. You were thinking. In your glory, you thought, what is going to happen after me? I am going to die one of the days. What's going to happen in the days to come? In the years to come when I'm not around? What's going to happen to my kingdom? What's going to happen in this world? If he really forgot the dream, he, like a snap of a finger, start to remember, yeah, that night I really was thinking about these things. Now I know, I know what was a dream, but Daniel didn't, said, okay, I'll tell you what's your dream. But he gave him another beautiful testimony. Listen to this. In verse 30, he went on to say, but as for me, the secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sake that shall make known the interpretation of the king. And that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, great statue. This great statue, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee. And the form of it was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze its legs of iron, its feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest until a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon its feet that were of iron and clay, and broke them to pieces. Then were the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell its interpretation before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. 
and wherever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made the ruler over them all. Thou art the set of gold. Can you believe the look on the face of that king when he told him about his own dream? That if, behold, you are standing someplace in front of a great statue, look to you frightening, made of different kinds of metal and stones, huge image standing before you. The head of it was of gold. And that's what we want to concentrate on this morning and this hour, the head of gold. He said, you are represented in the head of gold. See, that was not a prophecy there. That part of the picture of the prophecy was not a prophecy. It was just a statement because it was already fulfilled. You are this head of gold. However, the Bible never left a stone and turned on the prophetical events of the kingdoms. This is why there are some prophecies concerning Babylon, some beautiful prophecies. Let's see what the Bible prophesied about Babylon. In 2 Kings chapter 20, it tells us about another beautiful short story about a king in Judea called Hezekiah. He was very sick, very, very sick, and he was about to die. He prayed to God and God answered his prayers and he said, all right, I'll give you 15 more years. And in order to make sure that you understand what I'm saying, that I stand for my word, I'm going to let the sun go back 10 degrees. And it did 10 degrees. He saw the shadow of the sun going back the opposite way than it should have been going, proving to him that God means what he said. And God gave him an extra 15 years. He was healed. In his state of recuperation, he started to receive some kind of nice get well card, recuperating cards with gifts. See, lots of people think this is an American fad, sending someone a card when he, they are in the hospital or when they're sick, get well soon and stuff like that. Well, that's not right. That fad started way even before Christ sending them a get well card. Let me show you that in chapter 20 of 2 Kings and verse 12. At that time, Berodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent a get well card. Not one, he sent several get well cards. He sent letters. And not only a card, we all usually send a card, and if they're very close, we send a card and a bouquet of roses or, you know, a plant, a gift. Huh? The same thing happened there. That's not something new. People with taste do have taste, you know, and send a card. And if they are close people, like your very close friend or your mother or your father or your son, you send them a little gift, like a little plant, some money, whatever it is. So this King Baladan was a very tasty person. He sent him not only one card, bunch of cards, letters. And with that, he sent a present unto Hezekiah. I'm sure it wasn't a bunch of roses. Because by the time he would have taken the roses from Babylon to reach Judea and Samaria, those roses would have died long, long before they arrived into the city. That must have been a beautiful present he got, other than just roses. I'm sure it was some kind of gold brooch or something like that. So he sent the present unto Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah hearkened unto them, and showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold, and the spices, and the precious ointments, and all the house of his armor, and all that was found in his treasuries. There was nothing in his house nor all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. 
when he saw his, how tasteful they are, and they are full of taste that they would come walking, cutting the desert of Syria and Iraq from Babylon to uh, Judea, carrying a present and get well cards, he was so impressed that he showed them everything he had. He even was the guide for the tours. He was so much impressed. Verse 14 goes on to tell us something very dreadful. Then the man of God, Isaiah, came unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? From where came they unto thee? And Hezekiah and his greater flattery said, They are come from the end of the world, from a country far, far, far away. Aren't they very tasteful? They came even from the end of the world, from Babylon. At that time, Babylon was the end of the world, almost. And Isaiah said, What have they seen in thine house, you great king? And Hezekiah answered, All the things that are in mine house have they seen. There is nothing upon my treasures that I have not showed them. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And some of thy sons who shall issue from thee, whom thou shalt beget, shall they be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs and servants and slaves in the palace of the king of Babylon. What a dreadful thing to say. Here the king was so happy, was so flattered by those who came from Babylon. Babylon at that time in 712 BC was a very small city, a city not even to contend with, not to be compared with the greatness and the power of Judea and the kingdom of Judea. And here he's telling him, the prophet is telling the great king of Judea that the king of that small city state would come and destroy his kingdom. What a thing to say. That was impossible even to think that that could happen. Babylon, that little city, destroy our own kingdom, that's impossible. But the word of God said it would, it would. And of course the Bible, backed by history, told us that Nebuchadnezzar came from Babylon. That small city that became a great empire came in 586 BC and destroyed the city and took the people of Judea into the captivity. And thus the prophecy was fulfilled in totality, even though it was uttered by the prophet Isaiah in about 710 BC. And the rest of the prophecies that were mentioned by Daniel in chapter 2 of his book will be discussed in details in coming messages. And of course, he mentioned that after Babylon, more empires would rule the world, and he mentioned them by names he even mentioned the areas where they're coming from. And that was hundreds and hundreds of years before they appeared on the stage of world events. Most amazing. And the sequence by which those empires would appear would be as follows according to Daniel. History provided all the evidence of the trueness of his prophecy. And they were as follows. The Persian Empire will come, will be replaced by the Greek Empire. And the Greek Empire will be replaced by a system that would never disappear from the face of the earth. Until the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got to listen to these studies. They are literally mind-boggling. Now, let's please look again at King Hezekiah. There is a great lesson for us to learn. Now, why? The first thing that comes to my mind, why would, would Isaiah say something like that just abruptly? Stand here and say, what did they see in your house? And he showed everything I have, I showed them. And he got so mad for telling him that. And he looks at, at the king in the eye and says, everything you showed him is going to be carried away into Babylon. And even your sons and your great-grandsons are going to be taken into Babylon. Now, we'll, we'll hold it. Why did you say stuff like that? That's what I call the Hezekiah syndrome. 
You know what say Hezekiah syndrome? I bet we have it and we don't know we have it, don't we? I tell you what's the Hezekiah syndrome. Those people came from a far country, pagans, people that are unsaved, came to see the great working of God in this man's life. You know, he never mentioned God. God healed him directly. He didn't only heal him. He showed him tremendous evidence. He let the sun go backward. That's almost impossible. Not almost. That's impossible, period. And God is the God of the impossibilities. He gave him healing and he said, I'm giving you years to come. You were supposed to die tonight. I'm going to heal you and give you 15 more years. For that, I'm going to let the sun go back 10 degrees. That's impossible. You know, the earth goes around at a tremendous speed. He had to stop it and bring it backward to show him something that could never be seen in any time in history by anybody. He let it happen. And when those men came from the end of the world, he didn't even tell them about God. Look what he showed them. Knickknacks. This knickknacks we got from Florida. This one from Chicago. This one from New York. People come to visit us. We lose the time talking about knickknacks and we never tell them. The most important thing in our lives that we were sinners condemned to hell hopelessly, helplessly. And then Jesus came into our lives, saved us, and gave us everlasting life. That is the most important thing in the life of the Christian. Not knickknacks from Florida and something from Chicago and something from Detroit. These are going to go and be perishing away forever and ever. We have something eternal, God, in our lives that the people ought to see first. Don't be like Hezekiah. Show them and losing all time. He said they stayed in your house for two weeks. What did they see? Did they see Jesus? Did they see God? No, sir. They saw the knickknacks in my... They saw the beautiful TV I have. They saw the stereo and that beautiful system I have. They saw everything except Jesus. And this is why he said, My friend, all this, those stupid knickknacks you showed them, these they're going to carry away. Notice. Notice how unfaithful Hezekiah was. You read chapter 19. Not now, later. You read chapter 19. He was under tremendous, tremendous pressures from the king of, uh, of Syria. And he was paying him taxes. What did he do in paying his taxes? This is another syndrome, Hezekiah syndrome. He took everything belonged to God. He went to the temple, took all the gold of the temple, paid taxes. Took all the knickknacks in God's house and paid taxes. Took all the money in God's house and paid taxes. Took all the missionary funds and paid his taxes. But he kept all the things that I see. All his treasures, all the armories that are in the arms that are in his armories, he kept it. All the things, all his money, all he never paid taxes with that. But the things that belong to God, he paid taxes with it. Like when we work, let's be frank here. We work to, we have bills to pay. We were supposed to keep some of that check from our income for God's, God's work, the church, the missions, stuff like that. What do we do? Oh boy, now we can't do that. This, we have so many bills to do. Now wait a minute. We take this money here, the, the, our tithing here, we take it. We shouldn't pay this month. We have so many bills. So we take our money from the God's money, not our money here. We have some luxuries. We can't take it out of the luxuries. We take it from God's money. Oh, we pay it for bill. This is what Mr. Mr. Hezekiah did. And God cursed him for that. He said, give me the tithe and try me with this and see if I don't open the gates of heaven and the windows of heaven with blessings. You know, I've met some people and I was talking about how can you pay all this money for the Lord's work. One guy was paying 50%, a friend of mine. I, preacher, couldn't understand how he could do that. 
I said, how do you do that? Well, he said, I'm going to tell you now. He's teaching me. I'm the preacher and he's just a regular member in the church. All right? And he was teaching me. He said, I trusted Jesus. The way I understood my Bible, I'm going to continue another five minutes anyway. He says, the Lord tells us in his book, you give me and I will give you in accordance with what you give me. You give me little, I'll give you little. And he said, I give him money. And boy, I don't know where the money has been coming from all over. All over. It has been coming. The more I give him, the more he gives me. Try me, he said. Hezekiah didn't. He said, all right, you have been, you paid your bills from God's money. You paid your bills from missions money. And you're trying to build up your house and the stuff around your house and your knickknacks. He said, all of this is going to be taken away. I assure you, so many people build up beautiful homes by the, what was supposed to be, you know what? The Lord's money. You know what happened? A little match took their everything away. What we have in this world is not ours, believe me. Whether it's going to be, we're going to leave it or somebody's going to take it. Thieves, tornadoes, fires, earthquakes. And in California, did you see those beautiful houses that cost millions of dollars? A wave come and took it back with it to Hawaii. <laughs> Nothing we have. Even in the most exclusive part of the United States of America, they couldn't keep it. They took it away. What we have, what Jesus said about Mary, she has chosen the thing that cannot be taken away from her. My friend, if we have Jesus in our lives, we were just singing that, that song, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed, redeemed, and his child and forever I am. Let the whole world know we are on God's side. And let's not go to Hezekiah's problem. Let's finish the prophecy in the next hour. And then we see what happens. God bless you.